Um, thank you, and um, good evening, everybody. And again, um, thanks for um, giving me the chance to chat to you this evening. It, that, that was actually, uh, if you saw the date on the front, uh, 25 years ago this summer. Yeah, I know. Um, I don't know whether it makes you feel bad. It makes me feel bad, um, if you do remember any of it. And uh, the interesting thing about it is that... that uh, that, that yellow vest was my Jarrow club vest. That's where I come from, Jarrow in, in, the, in the northeast of England. And uh, I grew up there in the, in the 70s. And, and I think you know, uh, sports people often give across this aura that somehow their, their, their destiny was preordained, that you know, you're always going to be this uh, wonderful, you know, uh, world-beating athlete or golfer or tennis player, that you had this supreme talent that was recognised a, at a very young age. And you know, it, was, it was just a case of uh, when it was going to happen, not if. And a lot of my career, even up to that point, I almost believed that crap, to be honest. You know, that, that it was, you know, that somehow it was just a bit um, easy. It felt easy. And all top-level kind of performers have this, uh, you develop a, a kind of uh, a view of yourself, which is a bit inflated if, if, in terms of your ability to go on and, and eventually break a world record. And if, if you'd interviewed me at 13, 14, I would have sounded like a real pretentious little so-and-so if I'd said, yeah, 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 I'm a, I like running and one day I'm going to be the fastest guy in the world to run, um, to run a mile. And what I've learned in, in, in years since I've finished, and it's been a good few years now since I've finished and gone on to do other things, and, and uh, as JJ's alluded to, you know, I wear diff lots of different hats these days, including broadcasting with the BBC, which I've been doing for about 12 years now. Um, it was only when I got towards the end of my career that I started to realise and understand a little bit more about myself and why I'd been successful and hanging around the Seb Coes and the Steve Ovets and the Daley Thompsons and then as, as years went by, Colin Jackson, Jonathan Edwards, Steve Backley, Denise Lewis, Sally Gunnell, you know, and just keep uh, tripping off names of people who've been incredibly successful and then once I moved out of athletics, you know, hanging around our, our, um, other Olympians and what you started to see, what I started to see was this idea that success is not an accident. And that's really one of the subjects that I, that I like to, to talk about. And I, I know that, uh, particularly if you're from the corporate world, that people from sport are meant to come along and sometimes, you know, somehow motivate everybody to go out and, and make millions of pounds for themselves or for the companies. And it doesn't work like that. It, you know, I don't make claims to do that. What I, what I do is actually try and pick out the reasons why I think I was successful, what I learned about myself, what I've then learned in, in the ensuing years about the other people I've hung around with. And to be fair, what we've then done, and what, what I've had quite a major role um, in changing the face of British sport, and one of the other hats I wear, um, I'm chairman of what's called the English Institute of Sport. And the English Institute of Sport is part of our whole lottery-funded program, which um, has been in place since uh, 1997. Lembert say I'm not going to get political about it, but I would say one of the good things that happened under the previous government was what happened in sport, particularly high performance sport. And the, that idea that it's not an accident, that actually there are talent is just a little bit of the um, uh, formula that makes up these you know, great icons of sport, and therefore we've become these kind of uh, uh, talisman, if you like, that the, held up as examples of that's how you become successful in life. And the talent is often used as this bit of an excuse, and that's why I, I said that I learned that actually, when I look back on my career and talk to all these other people, it was the work ethic, it was the attitude, that was what shone through. There's a great book out at the minute, Matthew Syed's just completed this book, and he said, on average, Tiger Woods in tennis, Roger, Fed uh, sorry, Roger Federer in tennis, Tiger Woods in golf, athletes, etc., a minimum of 10,000 hours of training have gone into their careers that get them to the top. 10,000 hours. You know how many years of work that is, working nine to five, eight hours a day? It's a lot. And people overlook that. And I overlooked it. I started overlooking it about myself. What you then also do is you have an environment, you create an environment around yourself, which is about um, success, which is about having that kind of positivity, the people around you who aren't negative, who aren't backbiting, who aren't, which is why politics is obviously a very difficult area to work in because you're, you're in a very negative environment. And success doesn't really feed on that very well. It needs a po really positive environment. So one of the things we try to do in sport uh, over the last... Does anyone know where we were at Medal Table in 1996 in Atlanta? Anyone want to hazard a guess? 36th. 36th. All right, we won one gold medal. Anyone want to guess what that was? 
bloke in a boat. Right. Yeah, um, <clears throat> big bloke. Doesn't look good in lycra. Uh, Steve, <laughs> Steve Redgrave. But we were 36 on the medal table. And with the inception of lottery, things like the EIS, which is about our sports science, sports medicine, the little things that make a difference, we started to look at our governing bodies. Why aren't they successful? Look at the environment. It wasn't the athletes. We've always had talented people. But how do we get them and the environment around them to change so that they are allowed to go on and be you know, the, the talent and the ability that they have and the hard work that they put in, that they're allowed to be successful? And Beijing, three Olympic Games later, fourth in the medal table. Only the USA, Russia and China are now ahead of us. And it's been a massive transformation. And I've learned so much through all of that. And I've always been fascinated about why it is that people like myself, like Seb Co, um, uh, like Jessica Ennis at the minute, why are those people so, are they so different? Are they so different to people standing in this room? They're not a lot different. And actually trying to tease that out and apply it into our normal lives and picking up on what Lembert said earlier on. What I certainly try and do is try and get this to relate to people on a, on a very personal level. And usually within the business world you'll see the same people being successful because they follow the same sort of traits and they have the same type of attitudes. And it's about picking those little things out. Understanding what are the little things that make a difference. The margins that you're working are tiny and they're getting smaller and smaller. In 2004, the Olympic Games, take three of them. Kelly Holmes, Chris Hoy, and the rowing four. All won gold medals. Their combined winning time, their combined winning time was 0.14 of a second. That's about that. Three gold medals were, took, were won in the time it takes you to clap your hands or to blink. And when I spoke to Kelly afterwards, I said, Kelly, what was, you know, Kelly Holmes had had a long career. And she came on with two gold medals, in, in, and she'd always had good attitude. She'd always had... And I said, what is it over the last couple of years that we, at the age of 34, and she goes, you know, I finally understood that I couldn't afford to miss anything out. That every bit of detail that in the past I used to take some things for granted. She goes, I don't know what the single thing was that made a difference. She goes, so I took care of everything. Whether that was nutrition, a physio, the psychology, all, all of the things which she'd kind of just allowed to happen for a while. In that occasion, for that period in her, in her career, she'd actually said, if I'm going to win, well, if I'm going to lose, it's going to be by the tiniest margin. And what I don't want to do is to leave anything you know, outside of the track. So I take everything into me that I'm, is going to enable me to perform. So I'm fascinated about that. You know, why some people will decide to run the London Marathon for no particular reason. And they might not have done the training. And they might not have done the background. And they might not have much ability. And they'll crawl across the finish line. And other people will tell everybody what they're going to do and they'll get two miles down the road and then just stop and say, oh, I might do it next year. Or maybe they don't even do the training and don't even turn up on the day. And I'm fascinated about what it is that makes people tick and what it is that makes people rise above the norm, if you like. And we're working towards an Olympic Games in 2012. And it's been a massive uh, boost for sport in this country because it's given us, as a, as a collective, if you like, um, something to kind of aim at because as individuals I was so used in sport to having this goal oriented life and then you come out of it afterwards and short of starting a stud farm because I was trying to think what would you do what, what, you know, what do former athletes do you finished at 33, 34 and oh, well, horses have stud farms that sounded like a good life um, there wasn't much market for it at the time but you kind of go right and the, but the idea that then, okay, well, hang on, that's what I was... And if you move on to other parts of your life and do different things, the, 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 the same principles apply. And I don't care what anyone says, and if, you know, I'll argue with anybody and stand up and actually sit down with you and go through you know, how I conduct my um, life now. And I conduct it in the same way that I did as an athlete. And I had to go back to being goal-orientated, understanding about the, your attitude, understanding about your environment, making sure that whatever it was was making a difference, you took care of it. So 2012 um, is going to be massive for London. It's going to be massive over the next couple of years. Um, I do spend a fair bit of time, obviously, traveling the world still at major events. I've been to 10 Olympic Games, um, only three as an athlete. The other seven have now been as a broadcaster. It's much easier as an athlete. <clears throat> only had to turn up two days, <laughs> yeah, heaps in the final and that was it. Um, but I've learned a lot and I think the fascination with what's going to happen in London in the next two years is something which uh, people are really interested in and the story about you know, how we've been so, su su so successful, how we've turned British sport around 
is, is one which I think people really um, do enjoy hearing about. And there's a lot of great little stories in, in there about uh, what we've managed to do. I was a bit worried at one point, um, and you mentioned Delhi, and I'll just finish off with this, because I, I always like you know, trying to do as many anecdotal true stories as possible. And um, we had a BBC briefing today actually about Delhi, and you might have read about how it's not quite ready yet, um, but we'll, it's going to be all right, apparently. And now, I don't know if you remember, but in Athens, because uh, I kept saying to Seb, I said, Seb, for goodness sake, don't let people look at London and say it's not ready, you know. And, and it's all going well. It's all on schedule, thank goodness. But it reminded me of Athens, and Athens had the same issue, um, and they weren't ready. And we literally arrived, um, you know, a week or so beforehand, and they were painting the thing, and <clears throat> they were pushing all the nasty stuff out of the way, and under, you know, the stadium had just been comp uh, refurbished, and they were pushing stuff out of the way, and putting, you know, kind of... Um, uh, that, that sort of marketing stuff they put up to hide, uh, you know, tarpaulins isn't the right word, but you understand what I'm saying. And then they, um, I went to the opening ceremony, and it was a great night, it was alright, it was a nice ceremony. And I got a phone call the next day from a friend of mine, who I used to know from up in Newcastle, and he said, uh, you were at the opening ceremony last night? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, what are you doing? He says, oh, I'm in Athens still. I said, what are you doing here? He said, I've been working on the, um, on the games. I said, what do you mean? He says, I've been, you know, they've been, last month we're pulling people in from all over the world. We've been 24 hours a day, seven days a week, getting the whole thing finished. He goes, I was in the stadium last night. I said, you're kidding me. I said, really? He goes, well, he says, me and my few of the lads, he says, we were literally still tidying stuff away. And we've been working here for so long, we thought, wouldn't you think they'd give us some tickets to get in? I said, so did you get in then? You get? He said, well, no, they wouldn't give us anything. He says, but you know, one of the lads was wandering around, and there was a French lad, and uh, we were looking at all the building stuff around, and he goes, uh, the security was pretty poor. He goes, uh... I think uh, I have an idea. So he was a Frenchman who spent a lot of time in Newcastle. <laughs> and he goes, um, he goes uh, I will uh, pretend I am a French athlete. So he goes and he picks up a bit of scaffolding. And he went around to the security door where the athletes were, uh, were waiting to go in for the... And he goes, uh, hello, uh, my name is uh, Jean-Paul. I compete for France. And the guy goes, oh, yeah. The security were from Newcastle as well. He goes, um, oh, yeah. <clears throat> what event are you in? He goes, I am in the pole vault. I said, all right, and you go, and my mate says, that's why he got in. I says, you're kidding me. He goes, yeah, he got in. So the German lad says, right. He goes to look around, picks up manhole cover. And he goes, on, hello, my name is Fritz. I am from Deutschland. He goes, oh, yeah, what event are you in? And he goes, you're following me here. He goes, I am in the discus. He goes, a bloody big discus that, isn't it? He goes, I'm a big, strong boy from Deutschland. He goes, all right, and you go. So I said to my mate, what did you do then? He goes, well, bloody hell. He said, I wasn't let him get in. I couldn't get in. I had a look around. Bit of barbed wire, rolled that up, walked up to the door, I went, Hello, Jordy, Great Britain, fencing. <laughs> <laughs> and he got in. <laughs> anyway, that won't happen in 2012. I promise you it'll, be, uh, it'll be all be on time and it'll all be fantastic. And we will be hugely successful. And um, as I said, the story of you know, my career and how we've, what we've done in British sport is one which I think has a lot of resonance with what's happening over the next couple of years. And I'd be delighted to tell you a little bit more about that. Anyway, thanks very much. Steve, come over, thank you.